Okay, I've started the recording. Um, it's a great pleasure to introduce Michael Elwood today. Um, most of us know Michael, but he's very self-effacing. And so it's actually rather hard to find out about Michael. And so I'm going to tell you quite a bit about him today, which is going to, yes, I thought he would look down, make him look down. <laughs> Michael, as you know, is a New Zealander, a Kiwi. He did his honours degree in 1993 at the University of Otago in New Zealand, where he worked on determining halides in mixed halide solutions. Um, he then moved into a more uh, oceanography, marine science PhD after that, uh, and looked at the use of diatom opal as a recorder of surface seawater free zinc iron concentration. And what that translates to is he was the first person to look at zinc in silica um, tests of diatoms. Um, he then went on to some prestigious postdocs at the University of Liverpool, the University of Canberra, and also worked at the um, National Institute of Water and Atmospheric Research in New Zealand. Um, finally, returning back to Canberra in 2006, where he's been at ANU ever since. Now, Michael's really talented and has a hugely productive research um, portfolio. He's got about 100 publications, but at the same time, he's taught about nine different courses. And he has probably one of the heaviest teaching loads in the school, as well as a pretty heavy teaching load for postgraduate students. He's graduated 14 postgraduate students and seven honours students, and he has a lot of them working for him now. Um, in addition to that, he has a whole lot of um, hobbies. He runs, as you've probably seen, and he's a scout leader and a soccer coach, and um, he's led a large number of um, ocean cruises and trips, and we'll hear about some of those today with his talk on um, iron cycling in the Southern Ocean. So welcome, Michael. Thanks, Penny, for those very kind words. <coughs> uh, make me feel embarrassed there. Um, but again, uh, I'm going to talk about iron cycling in the Southern Ocean, but this is not just really my work. It's, it's part of a team, so I need to acknowledge the other members of the team. And I guess my good mate, Phil Boyd, has been um, intimate and intimately involved in this sort of work. So I especially want to acknowledge his support and um, help with this. And just um, acknowledge RSCS for the support of the marine work that we do here. So as I talk, I'm going to talk about, I'm going to talk about iron cycling in the Southern Ocean. But first, I thought I'd give a bit of an overview of the um, primary production in the ocean and then we'll delve into why iron's important. And then later on in the talk, we'll get um, into some more specifics about iron cycling in Southern Ocean eddies. Um, I guess Andy Hogg's been involved in a lot of eddy work, but um, we want to look at the biogeochemistry of these eddies as they have been pretty unsampled, I think, to this stage. So, so this is a sort of an overview of the talk outline. Um, I'm just going to give an overview of why iron's important how iron is linked to phytoplankton growth and why phytoplankton growth is really important for the climate we see on the planet today. Um, then talk a little bit about Southern Ocean eddies um, and then specifically about the eddy we sampled back in 2016. Um, and then I will cover um, iron cycling in that Southern Ocean eddy and then summarize um, the work that we did. So this is just a uh, global map of annual prime production in the ocean um, and what you can notice here is that the, the hotter colors indicate higher prime production and the cooler colors are lower prime production and the key point here is that we have um, sort of high prime production in the northern hemisphere here along the continental shelves and, and near continents but when we start to look at prime production in the open ocean gyres such as here in the Pacific or um, the North Pacific, the North Atlantic, we see that productivity is actually quite low. And if we look in the Southern Ocean, we also see that productivity is extremely low. Um, these numbers here are grams of carbon fixed per meter squared. But if we think about on a global scale, um, biological driven um, prime production takes up about 50 gigatons of carbon per year. 
a lot of that uh, carbon is recycled. Um, so it goes back into the atmosphere or CO2 is released back into the atmosphere. Um, but some of it actually gets exported. So those numbers are very big, but, and to put it into perspective, um, humans are releasing about eight to 10 gigatons of carbon per year. So we are perturbing the atmosphere, which is also perturbing the um, ocean's ability to take up carbon. Humans, um, well, people are also looking at um, ways of um, stimulating ocean primary production, because you can see this figure 50 gigatons is a large number. And if we could actually enhance that, um, we may be able to draw down um, CO2 from the atmosphere. So um, what we really want to do is understand what drives bon, uh, primary production, and especially in the Southern Ocean. And this next slide just highlights um, nutrient concentrations in the Southern Ocean. So that's our primary production um, slide there. And this is the nutrients in the Southern Ocean represented by nitrate. And what we can see here is that the nitrate concentration in this region is extremely high. And it's, it's not seen in other ocean, ba ocean basins, essentially. So something is limiting the phytoplankton's ability to draw down the nutrients here. And this may well be related to light because in the, our, our winter, the light levels are pretty low, so there's low um, photosynthesis. But also, um, we also have um, limited by the, the availability of iron in this region. And we'll, we'll start to touch on that. Um, just to put, the, uh, put this into perspective, it's an important um, thing to understand trace nutrients, trace element cycling in the oceans. There's been an international program called the Geotraces program um, aimed at trying to characterize um, nutrients in the ocean. And this is um, just a section from the Atlantic. So going from the Southern Ocean here up to the North Atlantic. Um, these are just sections or voyages that have been where uh, collected samples, um, analyzed those samples, and then looked at the concentrations or isotopes or whatever it may be. These sections are for iron. And what we can see is that um, we have some hot spots where we have um, significant iron inputs, and these are um, along the Mid-Atlantic Ridge here. These are hydrothermal inputs. Along here, we have um, inputs from the Saharan dust coming off Africa, putting an iron there. Um, and we can sort of see there's Amazon inputs as well um, from the Amazon River into the, into the Atlantic Ocean. But when we start to look at the Southern Ocean here, we start to see that the iron concentrations are extremely low. And this is because there's, um, it's remote, it's, it's away from dust input, so we don't have uh, much atmospheric input of iron into the, into the region. And also, um, it's uh, on part of a circulation conveyor belt, so there are processes that can remove iron from seawater like scavenging processes. This has also been done in the across the Pacific Basin, and this is some work that we contributed to. So, um, in 2011, we contributed to an Australian New Zealand sort of voyage that went from Australia across into the Pacific. Um, and there was an American voyage going from South America across into the Pacific as well. And this is the sort of section that we've put together. And again, this just highlights the sources of iron coming into, into the seawater. We can see there's a large iron input from the um, East Pacific rise, hydrothermal plume here, um, which propagates westward um, across the Pacific. Along on the, on the side here, um, against South America, we have continental shelf inputs, and this is because it's under low oxygen conditions, so we actually have a lot of um, sediment inputs and iron-2 being released from the sediment and then oxidised into iron-3. As we come closer to Australia, um, we have a bit of dust input, but as we move uh, eastward past New Zealand, we can see that the iron concentrations are extremely low. So th these... Um, Geotraces voyages has actually given us a good understanding of what the iron inputs are into the ocean. So we're gaining a handle on how it cycles. Um, but when we come to the Southern Ocean, um, we actually don't have many uh, numbers for the Southern Ocean when it comes to iron concentrations. Um, this is results from a modeling study highlighting um, what the dissolved iron concentrations might be. And again, what we can see is um, concentrations are generally close, higher close to the um, Antarctic continent, but as we move away, those concentrations drop off. And the likely inputs, uh, we can think of a number of them. We can think of um, dust inputs from South America and Africa, um, from Australia. We have iceberg shedding, which drops iron into the water. 
Um, and we also have um, bottom water processes that interact with the topography and bring iron up into the, into the surface ocean. Um, and the Southern Ocean is particularly important, as I highlighted before, the nutrient content, but also it's the um, communication conduit between the Atlantic, Indian and Pacific Oceans. And, and that's through these various water masses where we can see deep water formation forming near Antarctica and propagating it uh, out into these basins. We have intermediate and mode water in, um, formations as well. And that's just highlighted here. These, these are intermediate water masses that are, are are formed around 500 and, and between 500 and 1500 meters and they propagate outward into these ocean basins. So whatever happens in the Southern Ocean tends to get propagated out into these other ocean basins. So the Southern Ocean is a particularly important um, basin for understanding how um, our climate moderates, but also because it um, distributes those signatures out into those other basins. There's been a number of um, large experiments looking at um, the influence of iron on Southern Ocean phytoplankton productivity. And I just want to highlight this one here, which is the Southern Ocean Iron Release Experiment, uh, Soiree. And if you look hard, you can see this little um, uh, image on, or this um, little blip on the map of this is a chlorophyll image of, um, of ocean color. So what we can see here is this um, sort of, um, blip and what happened here is that they released three tons of iron over a seven by seven patch uh, uh, square kilometer patch of water so this is the results here so they on day one they put in three um, about three tons of iron along with some traces um, and this was the background chlorophyll concentration and by about day 12 they had stimulated a large phytoplankton bloom um, and we can see that the co2 was drawn down um, in that phytoplankton bloom. And this was basically conclusive evidence that iron is um, whole, or iron limitation of the Southern Ocean um, reduces its uh, efficiency in drawing down those um, nutrients like the nitrate I highlighted. But also it highlighted that um, if we do stimulate these large phytoplankton blooms, we could actually draw down a, a large amount of carbon. Um, so this is the change in dissolved in organic carbon content within, within this patch here, and this is in tons of carbon. You can see they removed about 1,500 tons, 1,500 tons of carbon per, for the three, uh, three tons of iron that they added. The caveat associated with this experiment is that a lot of that um, carbon that was fixed by the phytoplankton actually got recycled back into the dissolved in organic pool, so it wasn't exported from the surface ocean, which is important if you wanted to use that as a way of moderating climate. Um, and we've also done a lot of um, incubation experiments in the lab where we can ma manipulate the iron concentration in cultures and see how that influences um, phytoplankton growth. Um, this is just some work from Scott Mayrick where he looked at iron and, um, sorry, the physio physiology of diatoms. And here we can just see that the, the um, chlorophyll within the diatoms changes upon iron limitation and the cell size changes. So the cells here are getting larger as well. This also um, changes um, cell um, physiology. I don't need you to take into the detail here, but just, um, just to highlight that these colors, so these colors just represent the log change in um, gene expression within cells. And you can see upon iron addition or removal, um, you can actually change the physiology of uh, phytoplankton cells. Um, the iron cycle in the Southern Ocean also varies seasonally. Um, in the winter, we have uh, very strong storms um, and low light levels, so we get very little heating of the, of the ocean. So we actually tend to have uh, deep mixed uh, layers. So a stormy in the spring um, brings nutrients to the surface, brings iron as well. And as the, um, we progress through the seasons from winter through the spring, we get some uh, warming of the surface ocean because we have higher light levels. And once the mixed layer shoals to a level that's um, sufficient enough, a sufficient amount of light for phytoplankton to grow, we get these large phytoplankton blooms that can occur. Um, and as they occur, we tend to see changes in the um, types of cells that, that occur. Um, so we go from large diatoms, generally in spring, to smaller cells in summer and autumn, where the iron and nutrients gets recycled. 
Um, and just for context, when we think about well, the work that I'm going to present, um, we're actually um, looking at around the late summer, early autumn sort of system. So we're looking at a system that's dominated by small cells. So to put our work into, into context, I've developed a sort of a conceptual diagram of um, how we might think that the iron might cycle in within an eddy. Um, so we can think of the number of pools of iron within the euphotic zone and in the, the, the waters below. So we can think of an inorganic pool with a lithogenic component. We can think of a dissolved pool where we have iron in two redox states and complex two ligands, which is highlighted by this L here. And we can think of um, iron or, um, within cells, so it's taken up by cells. Um, those cells may well sink after they um, finish growing, die and then sink, and we can get iron recycling from those cells and putting it back as iron 2 or iron 3 back into the water column. And we get eviction back into the surface ocean or sinking into the deep ocean. So th this um, conceptual diagram is a, a way of looking at the key processes and how iron might cycle in the, in the ocean. Um, and for today, we're really gonna look at uh, biological uptake um, and it's the cycling between cells and the dissolved pool. There will be a little bit of um, exchange between the lithogenic pool and we can think of um, regeneration of iron from the cellular nitritis. Um, just a small primer on iron isotopes and why we want to use iron isotopes. Um, so iron isotopes, there are four stable iron isotopes um, from 54 to 58. Um, we express it in delta notation and we can use these isotopes to actually trace the sources of iron into the ocean and, and this is just highlighted in the isotope composition of various um, components that are um, put into the ocean so we can think of crustal inputs or um, aer aerosol inputs which are close to zero per mil. Um, we can have reductive iron inputs from say waters that are near uh, under low oxygen conditions what we might have near South America they would have an isotope composition that's quite light. Or we can think of something like rivers, which might have a quite a large range in the isotope composition going from a light to a heavy isotope composition. Um, we won't talk too much about um, using iron isotopes as a, as a source tracer. Um, we're gonna think about more of a process tracer. So when you're away from sources, um, low dust input, or away from continental shelves, we can really start to look at um, the use of iron by phytoplankton and trace it um, using the ionosotopes. And this is just highlighted that we did a bit of work off the east coast of New Zealand. Um, we tracked a phytoplankton bloom here. So we've got, this is the isotope composition across the top here on the x-axis. This is depth going down the water column. We were looking at the dissolved iron pool and the particular iron pool. And here we can see the dissolved is lighter than the particulates in the upper water column. And as our phytoplankton bloom um, developed and took up iron, we can see that there's a transition from the dissolved and the particulate where now we have the dissolved pool being um, heavy and the, and the particulate pool being light. And this is associated with iron being, or the lighter isotope of, isotopes of iron being taken up at a quicker rate than that of the heavy. So we, hence the partic um, particulate pool becomes lighter. So this is a really nice way of using iron isotopes to track um, process changes in the ocean. Um, so now we'll start to get into um, a bit more specifics of our study and looking at eddies. Why eddies are important? Well, um, they, they dominate the Southern Ocean, I guess, along the frontal zones. So that at any one time, there's about 1,200 eddies in the Southern Ocean. Um, this is just a map here of eddy coverage. And we can see there's a large number of eddies in these frontal um, regions. So the, these dark lines here, represent different frontal regions where we get large temperature changes. So that's a gradient in temperature. So we can think about um, subtropical waters north of these lines and, and um, polar waters southwards. And these are representing subtropical and um, subantarctic fronts. Um, and this is just the eddy coverage. And we can see south of Australia, there's a large eddy pool or field here. Um, and the lifespan of these eddies can vary quite significantly around from six weeks to 14 weeks. And they can also propagate um, larger distances. So as they move, they can take the biogeochemical properties of that water and move them around. So they can move them many hundreds of kilometers. So um, the region that we're gonna look at for my study is in here. 
Um, and this is just a compilation of eddies within that region between 1993 and 2014. Um, and this is looking at eddies with a lifespan of greater than about uh, 90 days. And you can see that any eddy that is larger than about 90 days has a large diameter. So it varies from about 100 um, kilometers up to 250 or more. Um, so um, there's been quite a bit of work looking at eddies um, in the Southern Ocean and how they um, vary annually. And this is a study by Dawson from um, UTAS. And they, they um, looked at nearly 40,000 eddies, um, cyclonic and anticyclonic. Um, and then they've sort of delved into a bit of the Southern, into the Indian Ocean of, sector of the Southern Ocean where we were studying. And this is just highlighting the changes in chlorophyll. This is a normalization of chlorophyll from the seasons going from summer, autumn, winter, and spring for anticyclonic and cyclonic eddies. And so what we can see here is anticyclonic eddies, um, they tend to have higher productivity in summer and autumn and lower productivity in winter and spring, whereas the reverse occurs for cyclonic eddies. So they tend to have lower productivity in, in summer and autumn, and um, winter and springtime is when they have higher productivity. And this is related to the mixed layer depth. So the mixed layer depth of cyclonic eddies tends to be uh, slightly sh uh, shallower than that of anticyclonic eddies. So um, we tend to have slightly higher light conditions in winter and spring. So that's why we have slightly higher productivity in those eddies um, relative to the background. And in, in summer uh, and autumn, those nutrients are used up and um, and the iron is reduced, and so we tend to have a lower productivity. And what we are interested in is when we went out and sampled, we um, sampled in, in the autumn time um, in a cyclonic eddy. And th this is some of the details of that cyclonic eddy. So just to orientate yourself, we're um, south of Tasmania here um, inside this box. So we had three sites that we sampled, which are the Southern Ocean Time Series site here, the SOT site. This cold core eddy here, which is um, which we can see is low in chlorophyll down here, and it actually was about two degrees um, cooler than the waters surrounding it. And then there's another station which we use as a reference station, which is Southern Antarctic Station. Um, this was um, had slightly higher um, chlorophyll production and slightly warmer waters. Um, and if you're interested, this work was just came out this year in, in this paper here. Um, we looked at the eddy formation. Um, so this is just how it propagates, and just this is the starting from January, um, how it propagated. So it started here um, in early February and started to propagate, and it was a stable sort of feature by about mid-March. You can see it here. Um, it traveled about 100, oh, sorry, 371 um, kilometers between formation and dissipation. Um, and it had a diameter of about 100 kilometers at the start, and when we sampled, it was about 200 kilometers. And over its lifetime, it um, rotated about nine times. Um, the, these are just looking at um, sea surface temperature, that, that um, map there. All right. So we sampled this eddy. Um, we did a number of transects across it with the um, taking CDD samples. We towed a um, Triaxis undulating CTD system. We collected trace metal samples, and that's the sort of rosette we use for tricking trace metal samples and processing the samples in trace metal clean bands. Um, the, we collected particles using McLean pumps, um, so we would drop them down and try and collect the particles. We also had in sediment traps that were free floating, so we can look at the um, organisms that are sinking out of the surface ocean and being collected. This is this um, undulating CTD system that we um, towed across the eddy, looking at its um, biogeochemical parameters. Um, we also had um, sediment traps we were putting out, um, and there were some other challenges that we had on this voyage, um, and some of them weren't just um, work-related. <laughs> um, but as you can see, um, some of the conditions can be quite difficult in the Southern Ocean, and it can be quite dangerous work. Um, so let's have a look at some of the characterization parameters for this eddy. Um, so this is the eddy here. Um, this is the 
the tri-axis tri tail across the eddy, and this is just looking at temperature. And what we can see is that there's quite a big gradient in temperature as we go into the eddy. So going from about um, nine to 10 degrees across to about seven to eight degrees within the eddy. We can see a drop in fluorescence, which is a proxy for um, phytoplankton numbers. That was a lot lower within the eddy. And this transmissivity here actually gives you an idea of how many particles are within the eddy. So the more clear the water is, the higher the transmissivity, or the closest we get to 100. So you can see within the eddy, um, there was less particles compared to the waters external to the eddy. And so just to summarize the eddy conditions, it was about two degrees cooler, had elevated nutrient levels and lower um, uh, phytoplankton numbers. And because the eddy is isolated, it's a bit like a mesocosm. So we can actually trace processes within it without having to worry too much about um, the external inputs. Um, the eddy also extended to quite a deep level. So here we can see this is the nitrate anomaly within the eddy and extended to about a thousand meters. And this lower, uh, lower panel here, <coughs> excuse me, um, just highlights the PO's particular organic carbon within the eddy. Again, see it's a lot lower. So let's move on to some of the dissolved and particular iron for within the eddy. So this um, panel here is just showing dissolved iron concentrations in nanomoles per kilogram or nanomoles per liter of water um, going through the eddy and down. So the red dots highlight um, our measurements within the eddy and the green and blue symbols highlight um, the SOT site and the Subantarctic Station site. Um, and what we can see is that in the upper water column, we see a light, significant depletion of iron. And if we zoom in on that, we can see that the iron is extremely low. Um, dissolved iron concentrations are around about 25 picomoles per kilogram of, um, per kilogram of water. And these blue um, triangles represent the particular iron pool within um, the city and they're extremely low as well at around about 28 um, picomoles. So we have a very low iron concentration and th these levels are a lot lower than you typically expect to see in external waters. Typically the external waters have between around 50 to 100 picomoles or um, yeah 50 to 100 picomoles of dissolved iron in the water. So this eddy is quite anomalous compared to the surrounding waters. We also looked at um, biological production in, in the eddy. So this is, if you look at the central panel here, this is carbon uptake. And the red circles are again biological production in the upper 100 meters. And we can see that it's depressed compared to external waters to the eddy. But interestingly, the iron uptake, so this iron uptake by the phytoplankton in the eddy is actually upregulated. So these measurements are for iron 55 uptake um, of the phytoplankton. You can see they're significantly higher than um, say at the subantarctic station, so the station here. And when we compare that um, normalized the iron uptake, we can see that this eddy uptake or the iron uptake within the eddy by the phytoplankton is completely different to what the other um, phytoplankton are doing external to the eddy. So it highlights that the um, phytoplankton are up upregulating their iron acquisition machinery to collect iron so they can um, sustain themselves. Um, and we can work out some fluxes for iron cycling within the eddy. So we can come up with a utilization rate of iron of around 1800 nanomoles per meter squared per day compared to the actual iron supply rate, which is, you know, orders of magnitude lower. And so this leads to a rapid turnover iron, of iron within the eddy. And we have a resonance time of iron in the dissolved pool of around about a day, which so highlights that the phytoplankton are heavily recycling the iron um, from the dissolved pool and, and scavenging or taking it up. Um, and when we compare this eddy to um, other studies within the Southern Ocean region, we can see it's anomalous as well. We can see that dissolved iron is much lower than all other studies. And we can see the iron to carbon ratio is completely different to all other studies. And, th and that's from the same sort of ocean basin. So if we go back to our conceptual iron diagram, we can, we really wanna, um, we've really highlighted how iron is being trafficked between the cells. Um, we've got some rates on for these, so we can see that we've got, if 
the rate of iron uptake here into the cells, we can see that the dissolved iron cycling is very fast and we've got a supply um, rate which is very low. So these eddies are quite anomalous and quite different to what we'd expect to external waters. Um, and this is where we started to try and understand how the iron might be cycled using the iron isotope traces. Um, iron isotopes as a tracer. So we can use iron to look at the uptake um, and we might expect um, the lighter isotope to be used at a faster rate than the heavy isotopes under kinetic uptake um, conditions. We can look at complexation of iron by um, organic ligands. Um, we might also be able to use our um, isotopes to look at iron redox changes. Um, for this study, we weren't able to collect iron two samples because the um, iron concentrations were too low, so we can't really say much too about iron exchange. Um, but we can look at iron hydroxy or exchange of iron between the dissolved pool and iron oxide um, compounds, iron hydroxy compounds, and we can look at iron um, regeneration from organic matter. So these are um, our iron isotope measurements. Um, as I mentioned, the dissolved iron concentrations were extremely low, so the error bars here are slightly larger than you'd expect for these isotope measurements because we ran into counting statistic issues. But what we can see is that the um, dissolved pool is isotopically heavy in the upper water column um, relative to the particulate pool here. And it decreases as we go out of the ephotic zone down to a minimum around about 150 meters. Um, and if we contrast that with the subantarctic station, we can see we don't see these um, processes occurring at the subantarctic station. And that's because um, we have other processes occurring. So we have mixing and exchange, which tend to be higher external to the eddy. So our eddy was sort of isolated and um, behaved like a metacosm. Um, below the photic zone, we can also see that, as I mentioned, it went uh, isotopically light in a dissolved pool. And this corresponds to where we see a lot of heterotrophic bacteria and other organisms that would be consuming iron from um, sink into tridal matter. So they would be accessing um, the dissolved, accessing iron from the particulate pool and releasing um, isotopically light iron back into the water. So that hence our, our dissolved pool becomes isotopically light. And we can also have um, supporting measurements in the nitrate and the ammonia, um, which also are release products when you have a lot of regeneration of organic matter occurring. So th that seems to be a coherent story there that this light isotope number in the, in the dissolved pool is actually associated with iron regeneration from organic matter. Um, we tried to model our iron isotope results and so a typical way of doing it is using a um, Rayleigh type model and initially we tried that with this and we assumed that the um, eddy was closed and so we could um, apply a Rayleigh type model to it. Um, we can do that for the dissolved pool when we think about in the upper water column. Um, but when we start to consider the particulate pool and how it might evolve, we can see that these numbers here are the, the um, light colored or light um, red colored symbols represent the particulate pool. They're almost identical to what we see in the dissolved pool. And so it doesn't conform to some sort of Rayleigh model. Um, and that, that's likely because mixing and export influence the dissolving particulate pools. Um, so we can't assume a closed sort of system. So to get around this, we actually um, went back to our conceptual model and then um, developed a little um, 1D model to explain how iron might be cycling. And in that 1D model, we have include organic complexation, iron scavenging, cellular uptake, regeneration, and invective supply. And this is how we sort of put the model together. It's basically, um, a, well, it's like multiple, multiple box model, um, extending down to one, uh, extending from the surface down to 500 meters. So it's, it's basically a 1D model, which you can run through time. So we added some seasonality into it. Um, this is, uh, we added mixing and light levels and represented light as a photosynthetic active radiation. We've added that into it. And that's what this upper panel here is. Um, and we ran it through time and looked at the um, particular organic nitrogen and nitrate. Um, and these are sort of simulations that you can do and you um, tune the model to what you might expect you to see. So something like this. Um, 
Uh, and these are the outputs we get from the nitrate, um, particular organic phosphorus production, um, dissolved iron and particular iron. The model is not perfect, and you can see that in the particular iron uh, results. You know, ours is vertical for the model, and these are the, the blue symbols here represent the actual measurements. Um, but it, it gives us some, some insight if we, if we can use this model to um, understand isotope fractionation. And so we incorporate isotope fractionation into this model. Um, and then we started to look at the process that might lead to um, iron isotope fractionation. So um, uptake, complexation, regeneration, and scavenging. Um, and we've first looked at them independently. So in this panel here, we have um, the iron isotope composition versus depth for the dissolved pool, which is these red circles in the particulate um, pool, which is the the lighter red um, symbols and the diamonds and squares, and the dotted, blue dotted line is the particulate pool for the model, and the solid blue line is actually what we have for the dissolved pool. And you can see uptake using something like that gives you a value of uh, minus 0 0.6 per mil, gives you some sort of um, some sort of fractionation like that. We can put complexation, so iron um, under. As iron is generally complex to ligands or organic ligands in seawater, and so that's under equilibrium control. So we can put a, a fractionation factor associated with that. We can add a fractionation factor associated with iron regeneration at depth, and we can have a fractionation factor for iron exchange between the dissolved and lithogenic pools. And when we sum all these up, we can actually start to model our um, our uh, dissolved iron and particular iron values quite well. And so it's likely that we see multiple fractionation processes occurring um, and that's driving what we see in the iron isotope results um, for this eddy. And so putting that into our, our um, conceptual model, we can start to add, uh, add fractionate, isotope fractionation numbers to it. So we can have fractionation with um, uptake by iron by the, the cells and that would be under kinetic control. Um, fractionation associated with iron ligand um, complexation, and that would be under equilibrium control. Um, this is kinetic control again for iron release from particles. And then we ha would have some sort of um, fractionation associated with iron lithogenic exchange between the dissolved and particular pools. Um, one thing to remember about um, our sampling of this eddy is it's a snapshot in time. And so um, there's likely to be seasonality in the iron and particular iron isotope results. Um, and they're likely to vary between winter and summer. So if we run the model forward and we think about when we sampled, which was the start of autumn around about um, 1 April, this is the sort of profiles we uh, would get, or likely to get. If we run it, through for a spring sort of profile, again, you'd like to get something quite different. So you need to be mindful of when you're sampling and what other processes that might be occurring. And, that, and that's just highlighted in these sort of um, heat map diagrams here of um, iron isotope fractionation between dissolved and particular pools again, and the month that you're sampling. So in summary, um, we sampled a, a Southern Ocean Eddy and had a distinct iron biogeochemistry. Um, and this cold core eddy had extremely low dissolved and particular iron concentrations. And we do wonder whether this is representative of what we see for um, cold, core eddy, cold core eddies in general. So um, this needs to be investigated a bit further. Um, we also noticed that uh, Phytoplankton upregulated the iron acquisition machinery to cope with this low dissolved iron. Um, even though they've done all that, they, their productivity is still low because there's just not enough coming in. Um, and, th and that's reflected in the high turnover rates of iron um, between the dissolved pool and these phytoplankton. Um, and our iron isotopes actually tell us a lot about what's happening within the, in the exchange of iron between these various pools. Um, and I guess the plug for sampling on um, Southern Ocean eddies is that, you know, these are under a sampled proportion of the Southern Ocean and need to be explored a bit further. So finally, I just want to um, thank some collaborators, um, Phil Boyd, um, Robert Stripak, Pete Strutton and Tom Troll. They are all instrumental in um, getting this voyage off the ground and, and um, allowing us to participate. Um, obviously, the 
Marine National Facility for Ship Time, and the officers and crew on the investigator were fantastic. Um, it was a particularly trying voyage. Um, we managed to wrap stuff around the prop of the vessel, so we had to ha go back to Hobart, um, so and then go back out again. And you know, the, the officers and crew and investigator were fantastic. Um, and again, obviously, funding from the Australian Research Council. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. We will applaud both uh, symbolically here and uh, in the form of um, everyone rapping on their desks and so on. Um, I'll pass over to Penny if she's there to um, manage the questions if possible. People can type into the chat box or raise your hands. I think Andy Hogg got there first. But, uh, I'll pass over to Penny as the referee. Yep, no, Andy got there first for sure. Go ahead, Andy. Okay, thanks. So, Michael, you were kind of hoping that the Eddie would behave as a closed system and that you could use that to, um, to balance budgets, I guess, in through the surface. Yep. And, then, and then you sort of implied that what's missing is the vertical mixing um, through the base of the mix layer or, or maybe a bit deeper into the, into the eddy field. But is there, are you aware of anyone looking at lateral transport into the eddy, particularly by submesa scales, which can, when you have such sharp gradients at the edge of the eddies, the lateral transport could actually be really significant there. Has that crossed anyone's mind? Uh, I think so. Um, so Pete Strutton and their group have been doing it. I guess if I may go back to my slides, mm. um, if, if this goes, you know, the lateral transport would be reflected, I guess, in the triaxis data when we look at, um, well, if we get there, so sort of something like this. We don't see too many, uh, it's still quite a defined sharp gradient here. And there is some sort of, if you're looking at the temperature gradient across that, there is a little bit of, variability but i guess it's, it's still very de well defined across the edges of those eddies of this eddy i should say yeah but of course because the because the eddy is spinning relative to what's yes. there it'll it'll be drawn out into long filaments as it as it um like you often see of chlorophyll concentration from satellite and 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 that would produce sort of uh, more diffuse bands sort of like you're seeing in the temperature field at least um yep. so yeah, yeah, well, I guess that, you know, that's something we, well, our problem is that making these um, or collecting these iron measurements are difficult and they're just snapshots in time. You'd have mm. to do a very detailed study across the eddy or have some uh, way of measuring um, that iron at, at very high resolution across the eddy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, I realize it's not trivial. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, there's a question also from Charlie. Yeah, yeah. I, when I've heard people talk about mid-oceanic gyres, they talk about depletion of nutrients in general, for example, not just iron, but also phosphorus and nitrogen. Yep. And I'm wondering, I mean, if, if those uh, boats in 2000 that had spread all the iron all over the place and then the chlorophyll came up, if they had not spread iron but had spread phosphorus or nitrogen or something in a, an accessible form, would we then have seen these chlorophyll blooms or is it really that this part of the ocean is iron limited while other parts of mid-oceanic gyres would be limited by phosphorus or some other element or nitrogen? I guess um, if we go back to this figure here, um, Charlie, this, I don't know if you can see that one, yeah, when you say high nutrient, does that mean phosphorus and nitrogen? Yeah, so this is nitrate here. The, the southern ocean is, this one here is nitrate, so the bottom panel there. Right. And, and if you look at your mid-ocean gyres, something like the North Atlantic or the South Atlantic. Or, very low nitrogen. Very low in nitrogen. Um, there's always a residual amount of phosphorus there, so you have, tend to have nitrogen fixes there. Um, and, but the southern ocean is, a not, is um, quite different. You can see it's a high nutrient, low chlorophyll, and that's because we... There's two things that limit the productivity there. There's the iron and also, you know, the seasonality in the light field. So in winter, we don't have enough light. But, but why is the Southern Ocean unique in, in the sense of this diagram here? The nitrate, the nitrogen is, um, the nitrates are, are very limited elsewhere. And so, but in the Southern Ocean, it's the, it's not the nitrate. So why are there, why is the nitrate available there? 
uh, because there's no there's basically no iron and then winter there's no light so you need light to photosynthesize and you need iron to photosynthesize as well well then there's not much light in the northern hemisphere either and i don't see anything equivalent yeah well i think in the northern hemisphere and so if you go up to the upper panel here hmm. there's a lot of dust that comes in from um well, there's the Saharan dust plume that can propagate northward, but there's also a lot of iron coming off the shelves um, in the North Sea and um, coming out, I guess, from North America and um, Europe. Um, so if the iron levels are a lot higher there. If you, if you go back to what um, the Geotraces program have been trying to characterise all this, and they've shown that the iron levels are there. So productivity tends to be higher and they consume those nutrients quite quickly. Could it could the nitrate high concentration of nitrate there be because of the gigantic waves and the ocean? You know, lots of uh, I don't know waves breaking. Can, or something. can I butt in, Charlie? Yeah. So I I think what's happened. Oh, well, Jimmy's comment exactly. You got this all that region south of the ACC, the, the Antarctic Circumpolar Current. There is is upwelling. It's bringing yeah. old nutrient rich water. It's it's rich in nitrate and phosphorus, but not so rich in iron. And so you get a big supply coming up that way. But why isn't it rich in iron if it's, I mean, upwelling usually also- well, There's no iron sources. So your main source is a continental supply and mm. Antarctica is covered in ice. So there's no dust input from Antarctica. Mm. So the only input you get from, if you look at this diagram again, you can get from South America, from um, there you get a bit from Africa and you get a bit of from Australia and New Zealand. And that's about it. There's boom, boom. Can't really say bugger all, but there's bugger all coming in from anywhere else. <laughs> but you showed earlier that there was lots of iron coming from mid-oceanic ridges, for example, and there's nothing specific about the Southern Ocean that is the bottom of the ocean there that's different from the bottom of the ocean elsewhere in the world, is there? Oh, well, it, it, there is hydrothermal input. So if you go to Kukui Island Island, you get island wake effects. Um, so as the ACC moves eastward, you get the wake effect from here, so which is, would be, that's Kukui Island there. You get it from some of these um, subantarctic islands and Antarctic islands off South America, you know, the Falklands and um, are down there. So those are island wake effects, but generally there's, there's not much. Um, east of New Zealand, it's very deep and the, the iron doesn't get to the surface. Thank you. Um, I did see a hand up. Katie, did you have a question or did that... Um get answered. Oh, yeah, um, I, it, it may have been partially answered, but um, I guess I'll just go ahead and answer just, or, sorry, um, pose this as uh, just some clarification. Um, so first of all, Michael, great talk. I always enjoy hearing about the Southern Ocean. But um, I wanted to ask something very specific about uh, your plots with the model versus these observations from, I guess, was it like slide 36? I know the one after it was 37, but you have this uh, uh, model profile of particulates, which is flat throughout the, oh, 35. 35, yep. Yeah, so, so your particulate is flat throughout all of these models, whereas your observations, um, the two of them show very different variability. So I'm wondering, um, how you might explain that? Is that some sort of seasonal variation or is there even I, I some sort that, of like size fraction between the, the iron isotopes? Oh, look, we, I guess, you know, as I mentioned, you know, the model doesn't do the, a great, well, it, it's okay for, a, you know, it's a tool to actually understand the processes. It won't perfectly replicate what we are seeing. And you can see that here in this particular um, profile here with the model and actual particular measurements. So um, we acknowledge that, you know, there are other, other processes that might be occurring. And again, the other thing is that while this eddy has been isolated, you can, if, it's, um, if you've got suspended particulates there that have been entrained within the eddy as it's formed um, and aren't sinking, then they may well bias things as well. So, um, and you can also see with this um, dissolved profile here, you can see the actual measured profile is actually flat, or not quite flat, but down to about 200 meters, whereas the model suggests that it should increase. So while you know, it's, a, it's a nice little tool, and that, that's what it should be reflected upon as a tool to actually understand processes, it's not, it's not gonna be perfect. 
I hope that answers your question. Is there a bit of hand waving here? But you know, well, yeah, um, no, that makes sense. I, I was focused more on like sort of the conceptual, but but now look, re looking at the application, I, I see what you mean. So so that's understandable because, yeah. I mean, granted, we're also talking about these these incredibly small variations. Yeah, we are. I am. Yeah. So thank you. So what's next for the model while you're talking about it? Oh, look. Um, you know, there's a, there's a number of warts with it. I guess we've been talking to Al Tagliabu, which is a, a he's a biogeochemical modeler in, um, at Liverpool, and we're trying to, uh, he's been, he's got a PhD student there using a more GCM type model to actually incorporate the ion isotopes into it. Um, and it's hoovering up some of this geotraces data from the North Atlantic and other, to trying to put all this more into a um, global context. Cool, that'd be good. I thought the model was quite, quite spectacular, actually, <laughs> considering. <laughs> um, okay, Leanne has a question now. Uh, hi, Michael. Sorry, um, I missed the first half, so I don't know if you've covered this already. That's okay. <laughs> Um, so I just wanted to know, um, in terms of the phytoplankton within and outside of the actual uh, uh, eddy itself, um, did anyone actually characterise that? And if so, uh, what was the uh, you know difference between those those two two regions in, in context to the actual um, uh, nutrients and um, temperature changes? Anyway. Okay, we did. Um, well, I guess. Uh, not being a phytoplankton specialist. Um, no, I know. <laughs> but, but, um, but we did measure, you know, we looked, did size fractionation of all those. So of all of that's been done. Um, we looked at heterotrophic bacteria, nano, you know, and the smaller guys, the um, nanoplankton and picoplankton. Um, these waters were all dominated by small phytoplankton and small diatoms as well. Um, it's late in the season. Productivity's already occurred. So um, the large diatoms have disappeared. Um, and, and these waters were quite different. So uh, in the eddy, we can see these um, peaks in nitrate, um, oh, sorry, nitrite and ammonia. Mm -hmm. um, and we saw this peak in heterotrophic bacteria. You don't see that in the subantarctic station at all. No. It was um, basically an upper water column and then decreased. So what occurs in this eddy is it's, it's quite different to what's occurring to external waters. Um, and that's also reflected in the primary reduction rates that Robert um, strip act made for the you know the carbon uptake and the mm -hmm. and the iron uptake oh good okay thank you yes perfect we've run out of hands up um uh, does anyone else have a question ah charlie Yes, uh, my, my question is, you, you mentioned that life, uh, it's, you talked about the iron acquisition machinery of these phytoplankton and you talked about kinetic uptake. Um, I, you know, it's, it's well known that life has a, prefers light carbon, prefers C12 to C13. And uh, I'm wondering if there's something more general or more universal about the uptake of the light isotopes rather than the uh, heavier isotopes. And, or is this something associated with the types of, I don't know, Rubisco, for example, taking up the C12? Or, or is it, I'm trying to understand why there is this preference and how universal this preference for light isotopes is. Oh, it's a, well, it's under kinetic control. So if you have an equilibrium control, generally um, the heavier isotopes re remains complex because it's, it's harder to break that bond compared to a lighter isotope. So you need less energy. So um, if you have equilibrium control, you'll find that the dissolved pool will become slightly heavier if it's dominated by iron complexation of ligands. But when iron's being taken up by phytoplankton, it's generally under kinetic control. So they, there's no, rever well, little reversibility of that reaction. So the light isotope reacts faster, so it's taken up and incorporated into the organic matter. And that occurs for carbon and you can think for iron, iron as well. Nitrogen, um, phosphorus? Pardon? Nitrogen, phosphorus? Well, nitrogen, but not phosphorus, it's a monoisotope system. So um, oh. so nitrogen, you'll find nit they'd be slightly, I guess it depends on the acquisition of the nitrogen. Um, and nitrogen also goes through a number of reduction processes. You know, it goes from nitrate right down to ammonia, which is a large change in redox state. Um, so that'll have fractionation processes associated with it. 
but just a little plug for um, Sam Eggins. He's been he's measured um, the carbon isotopes on a range of our fighter uh, Southern Ocean fighter plankton, and he sees a range from minus 10 per mil for carbon right up to minus 38 per mil for carbon for some of these Southern Ocean diatoms. And so there's a whole range of different processes occurring um, when they're taking up this carbon and where the fractionations occur, whether they're taking up bicarbonate or CO2, um, where they have a perinoid and that's and a, so carbon concentrating mechanisms within the cell with how the rubisco does the um, fractionation as well. So, you know, it it's, can be um, organism specific. So applying a general rule may, may get you into trouble at times. And who's the guy who did the uh, the carbon isotope? Ah, uh, oh, that's Sam Eggins. Sam Eggins, okay. Yeah, he's a PhD student here. Thank you. Well, we're getting close to um, two o'clock, so I think we should wrap it up here. Um, Michael has said that he'd be happy to take questions from early career researchers and PhD students and master's students and even honor students now. Um, so, if those people want to stay on the line, um, I'd just like to again thank Michael before the rest of us go. So, you don't get a, a loud applause with this approach, but um, there's Thanks a lot going on online. <laughs> Thanks again. Yep, thank you very much. All senior people should leave.